thank you everyone for coming. Um, you know, uh, this, is, this is actually a very important session because when uh, Bachi and Namita first conceptualized uh, this year's edition of the uh, uh, Times Lit Fest and came up with the idea of focusing it on water and the sea, um, they told me that th there were several reasons why they did it. I mean, uh, one reason was because of Mumbai's very strange relationship with the sea. Um, at least what we feel is a strange relationship because it is a seaside city, we live with the sea, uh, we have the beaches, uh, it's a city that has grown up because of its uh, maritime trade. Um, it was founded because of it, its, uh, its natural harbour. And yet it's a city that over the years has lost its connection with the sea. Um, you know, if you read uh, travellers' accounts to coming to India via Mumbai, um, you know, until the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, it's always the impressions of the sea, of you know, the ship coming in uh, towards Apollo Bandar. Uh, you know, they talk about getting the first smell of India from 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 the from the, from the, when the land breeze comes towards the, the the ship, and how the the sea landing in Mumbai is the first experience most people have of India. But then, very abruptly, well, not so abruptly, from the mid 19th, mid 20th century onwards. Mumbai slowly turns its back on the sea. Uh, there are many, there are there are many reasons, of, uh, some of which we'll we'll uh, discuss. But there were two, two or three very practical um, uh, ones. One is the whole Back Bay reclamation, which you know turned the city's focus away from the east, which is where the port is, towards the west, which is now Marine Drive and uh, and, and 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 that whole area. There were a couple of factors like the Great uh, Mumbai Dock explosion, which gave the port trust the uh, the reason they needed to wall away the city because they said on the, the wall away the port, which they said on it was on safety grounds, and as a result, we are a city now which has very little actual connection with the sea. We go to the beaches, you know. Sometimes some of us take the ferries to Ali Bag. Uh, we are aware of like the container the, the transport, but otherwise, most of us really don't interact well, with this with the sea in any meaningful way. And um, when I read Lincoln's book. And actually, when I had a chance to interact with him about two and a half years back when he was uh, uh, in, in Mumbai, he told me one or two really interesting things. That this process, which I had thought was sort of unique to Mumbai, was actually something which was being see which was replicated in great port cities across the world. So could you, Lincoln, could you tell us a little bit about why this has happened? Why do port cities turn their backs on the sea? Well, um, first of all, thank you very much for, for, for joining us today. Um, the, a lot of it has to do with um, the, the two main factors from the mid, 19th, uh, mid 20th century on are the rise of containerization, which affected the, the, the shape of ports and, and where ports were located and could be located. And the second was the advent of the passenger jet, which meant that people no longer needed to travel by sea. And they quickly stopped doing that. Um, you can take that if you'd like. Um, and uh, so those two reasons are, are the reasons that, that people just have forgotten or lost sight of the sea. Because they literally have lost sight of the sea because they're not going on ships the way they used to. But the third thing was um, this weird uh, development that seemed to be, seems not to be universal but pretty pretty common of building infrastructure along waterfronts that effectively cut people off from the sea. And this was particularly true, I think Marine Drive is like this, it it's sort of hugs the shore, yeah. and so you can't, um, you can't easily walk to the beaches. Uh, in Manhattan, in New York City, uh, it's a 12 mile long island, and uh, the city planner there put a highway that literally rings the entire island. And it's almost impossible, uh, except in a few places, to get down to the water. Um, that's are, are there cities which are, port cities which have retained this connection? Um, Sydney maybe, Hong Kong? Uh, yes, Hong Kong certainly. Um, Sydney, I, I haven't been there in 20 yeah, years, but okay. I, th I think so. Um, London to a certain degree as a river city, but it's lost its port. So you go to London now and you go to places like Canary Wharf and you wonder why it's called Canary Wharf um, when it's just a bunch of very expensive um, buildings. And it's because they took out all the, the docks um, that were there and the, the heart of British shipping 
um, came up the Thames River to London. So it was an extremely important uh, port in its own right, and now the most important port in uh, England, as far as I know, is uh, Felixstowe, which nobody had ever heard of um, 25, 30 years ago, but it's now a major container port. Right, and uh, you know, th this is one of the fascinating things about reading your book, is that it shows how this sort of process happens all the time. Um, that uh, what we're talking about at a city level, uh, there are, there are either it's real history or there are myths at least that it happens at a national level. I mean, the most famous example is of China and the Zhenghe voyages, where you know the, the the Chinese emperor builds these extraordinary ships, like moving cities almost, which do which do these extraordinary voyages across the world, uh, you know, really far away from China, and then they come back, and the ships are scuttled, and China turns its back on the sea. Now I don't know, and you know maybe you can tell us if that's actually true. But again, this narrative happens, it happens in India too. Uh, that, you know, w that we know that India had this major maritime trade. But at some point, you know, the, the, it was of no interest really to the, Mughals, uh, to the Mughals, to the rulers of the Indian mainland. And again, we turn our backs on the sea. I mean, at, at the most basic level, here in, uh, here in Mumbai, we are building statues to Shivaji. And uh, there is hardly any monument to Angria. The great Maratha, the great Maratha admiral, his, he had, there is, his grave is there, but it's hardly anybody visits it. The last time I went, it was you know, pretty much derelict. So why do we do this all the time? Uh, well, the, the, the Chinese instance is, is um, pretty clear cut. The, um, the Ming dynasty was the first native dynasty in China for a long time. The Yuan dynasty were, were essentially Mongols, and they had swept across China and they got to the East and South China Seas, and it looked, I think, to them sort of flat, and it just looked like an extension of Central Asia. So they sent out uh, ex expeditions to, China, to Japan, to Java, to Vietnam, um, you know, really monumental undertakings. Um, they lost in all three cases, but uh, nonetheless, they, they had an outward-looking and expansive view of, of um, maritime culture because the Yuan, being Mongols, didn't have to worry about the Mongols to their west. Uh, when the Ming finally came into power in the uh, 14th century and, and consolidated it really in the 15th, um, they were very conscious of the fact that the Mongols were to their west and they wanted to make sure that that border was secure. So all of their attention was lavished on maintaining that border and security. They didn't feel, and rightfully so, that there was any reason to, to to really be concerned about attacks uh, on their coasts. There, were, there was piracy of a sort of fairly rampant kind, and they, they did address that. Um, but that's the reason that they, um, as, as, a, in a, as a bureaucratic decision, governmental decision, that's why they turned their back on the sea. But, but, but did private trade continue? There is a lot of, well, there was smuggling, piracy, uh, and, uh, lots of, there were private traders. Um, to the extent that there were, by the time the Europeans got to, to Southeast Asia, there were Chinatowns all over Southeast Asia. Uh, they were in Manila, they were in uh, Batavia, um, and in uh, Java, in uh, Malaysia. And um, it was what uh, one, uh, I think, Singapore Chinese scholar referred to as uh, merchants without empire. So these were people who did not have the blessing of their government, did not have the support of their government, were basically neglected by their government, um, except if they tried to return home, at which point they could be arrested. Um, and so there was trade. Mariners will trade whenever they, they feel like it, regardless of restrictions. Um, sometimes that becomes piracy, as we discussed yesterday. Um, sometimes it becomes something else. Uh, but. That is the reason that, they, that the Chinese, ha, people have this view of the Chinese as a non-maritime power. Um, another reason and another, I think, more important um, example of this sort of turning one's back on the sea from China is in 1964, the Chinese merchant marine had about 30 ocean-going ships. And now it's the biggest mar merchant marine in the world. It carries the highest volume of cargo. Uh, in the world, I believe. And, and they're building ports like right they're across building like, ports all over the place. Um, they've got the Belt and Road uh, program. Uh, 
uh, it's very, very ambitious. Maybe it's too ambitious, who knows? But it's, uh, the government has clearly embraced the idea yeah. of maritime trade because that's how they make all their money. Um, let, let's talk a little bit about India. I mean, uh, you know, your book has very deep and fascinating sections on, on India, both, uh, you know, bo bo both with relation to Tamil Nadu and the whole uh, the, the trade from, from South India to, uh, towards uh, 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 Southeast Asia and the, uh, the, Ara the, the, Arabian, uh, the Arabian Sea trade. And, you know, I've lived in Mumbai and Chennai most of my life and a lot of this was a complete revelation to me, you know. I mean, and I'll, you know, I'll give you, I'm, I'm making this point again about how we ignore our maritime history, but, you know, it, I'll give you two very uh, easy examples. You know, how many of you can name Bollywood films that are set in the sea or have anything much to do with the sea. The only examples I can come up with are films from the 70s and 80s which talk about smuggling. You know, when smuggling was, 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 like, was like an issue. I think uh, there are one or two other examples, but it, it's, it, it's, pre, it's pretty rare. The other example is monuments. I mean, everybody, you know, who comes to Mumbai goes to um, Elephanta to see the monuments over there which are amazing. How many of you have been to Exer in Borivili, which is not very far away from here, to see the truly amazing hero stones at Exer, which depict a really remarkable naval battle? Has anybody here been to Exer? See, this is, this is what I mean. Um, so, you know, this is what I, you know, how we, now let's t talk about what I learned from, 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 from your book. I mean, you talk about how sophisticated actually the uh, the the the, uh, the uh, Arabian Sea, the Arabian Sea, and the uh, Southeast Asian uh, trade was. You know, for instance, the, the boats. Can you tell us a little bit about the boats? Well, there there are essentially two um, traditions that one finds in, in the monsoon. Well, not the monsoon seas. Um, the monsoon seas, by the way, is just sort of a shorthand for the Indian Ocean, the South China Sea, and the East China Sea because they're all affected by the monsoon. But um, as far as the Indian Ocean is concerned, there were the sewn boat tradition of the Western Indian Ocean and, 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 and the Bay of Bengal. But uh, as you go into Indonesia, uh, they also have this more outrigger-based um, tradition, also sewn boats. And um, these were regarded by the first people to really start writing about them, um, i.e. Westerners, as primitive, inferior, leaky, uh, all sorts of different problems. But they were remarkably well suited for the, for the waters they traversed, and they were extremely effective. And the Indian Ocean up until probably this 18th century, maybe 19th century, uh, was the most heavily trafficked in the world. So the greatest volume of traffic uh, of, and numbers of cargoes came um, out of uh, or, or crossed the Indian Ocean. And another thing to remember is that the Indian Ocean, and I think we might have touched on this yesterday, is that um, the Indian Ocean is the only major ocean that's named for a place. And it's named for a place in the, in, in the Western tradition. It's named for India because this is where people wanted to get. Um, but it wasn't just that people were going from Egypt and the Mediterranean basin towards um, India. There was lots of trade between India and the Persian Gulf from the, the time of Malua and the Indus Valley civilizations. Um, there was also trade to the Red Sea uh, and to East Africa. So the Indian Ocean has had this um, robust maritime tradition, and you can't have a robust maritime tradition if you do not have robust ships. So. Um, if anybody ever tr suggests to you that Indian Ocean vessels were inferior, it's nonsense. I mean, I want you to tell us a little bit about what you discovered about elephants on ships. Because uh, you know, it's, it's like when I was a child, you, ha you had this sort of lateral thinking problem. Like, how would you weigh an elephant? You know, it's, it's like this thing that's thrown, that's thrown to uh, students. And uh, the, the, the maritime equivalent is like, how would you transport an elephant by ship? And uh, Lincoln has discovered that there were all these attempts made both in the Indian Ocean and elsewhere to transport elephants on ships. Well, right. I mean, otherwise, how, they're not going to swim. And so if you want to move elephants, you need to have elephant carriers. Um, the most famous and the oldest that we know about are, were called Elephantagos ships uh, in the Red Sea because the Egyptians, or the Romans in Egypt, um, kept... Uh, well, the Greeks and the Romans kept um, 
getting more and more war elephants uh, in Africa, and they kept having, because they kept killing them off or, or you know, uh, importing so many of them, they kept having to go farther and farther and farther afield. And to bring them back, the easiest way to do it, or at least one of the ways to do it, was to put them on ships. So they, de they designed um, particularly strong ships. Obviously, you need a fairly strong ship to, to move elephants. Um, but the same thing was done here uh, in the Indian Ocean. They also transported horses. Um, and so it, it, it has been possible to transport large, cumbersome, um, unlikely cargoes of all kinds, not just animals, um, by ship since people first started going to sea. And I, I mean, I'm making this point because, you know, so when, we, when we learn about, the little we learn about maritime history, even in Indian schools, it's like about, oh my God, Vasco da Gama discovers like the, the, the sea road to India as if like nothing existed before Vasco da Gama found the way into, uh, into, into the, uh, uh, in the Indian Ocean. Whereas I think what, what is evident from, the, you know, from studies like, like this, uh, that like Rinkin writes about is that there's this extremely sophisticated trade you know, for, for, for centuries uh, that, that, that went right across the uh, the Indian Ocean. I, I want to come back to ships because that's your speciality. But before that, you know, you just mentioned this thing about the, the naming of the Indian Ocean. And this is actually something that interests me because um, recently I did a, a story on the, on the problems that the naming of seas has. How there have been all these disputes about the naming of seas and what this tells us about our attitude towards uh, the sea. I mean, uh, it, this is, it, it sounds funny when I say this, but you know, post-independence, there was this huge move from Pakistan to contest uh, the naming of the Indian Ocean. They said, no, it should be called the Indo-Pak Ocean. Or um, uh, you know, another attempt was like, yeah, they, they would you know, raise this issue in places like the United Nations often and write letters and say, no, maybe you should call it the Muslim Ocean because you know, most of the countries around the Muslim Why is it be called the Indian Ocean? And, and, and you know, this issue about the, I think the South China Sea, again, is a, a sea where there have been, the, 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 or the Sea of Japan, which is, according to the Japanese, the Sea of Japan, according to Korea, the East Sea. Yeah. I mean, there are all these fascinating disputes about the naming of seas, yeah. right? And what, one of the ones that's come up in the United States, um, which was never an issue, and then all of a sudden it became an issue for reasons that should be fairly obvious, uh, it was always the Persian Gulf. Nobody ever called it anything but the Persian Gulf, and then all of a sudden it became the Arabian Gulf. And this was Americans calling the Persian Gulf the Arabian Gulf. Why? Because, well, we weren't going to call it the Iranian Gulf, but um, it's so yes. This na you know, the names of things are fascinating. Uh, fascinating and it, uh, inexplicable in some cases, and you know, very very much to do with you know, national parochial identities, and um, you know, we waste a lot of energy as individuals and collectively on on petty things like what are we going to call the ocean, but we do have to call it something. Um, but, you know, that also sort of ignores the fact that there are different parts of the ocean that have different names. So you do have, in addition to the Persian Gulf, you have the Arabian Sea, which I think is a fairly well-known name. Uh, you have the Bay of Bengal, um, and I'm sure there are, you know, straits and all sorts of different, uh, the uh, Gulf of Kambe. Yeah. Um, at least that's what I knew it as. Um, uh I, I'm just mentioning this point because it, it struck me that you know that there was all this agitation on the part of the, pa of the Pakistan government over the naming of the Indian, o the Indian Ocean. In fact, the Indonesian government occasionally raises this issue too. They, uh, in Indonesia, apparently, you are not supposed to say the Indian Ocean; you're supposed to say the Indonesian Ocean. Whereas the the Indian government, you know, which actually by purely by chance has this huge ocean named after it, never seems to show any any particular interest in it, which is ironic. Do the, does Pakistan have any intention of changing the name of the Indus River to the Pakus River, maybe? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you so, heard it here uh, first. Yeah. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about ships because, you know, that's in a sense where this book comes from. I mean, your earlier book uh, was, an encyclopedia, uh, was an encyclopedia of ships. And I want you to tell us a little bit about how ships are so important for understanding maritime history. Well, th th ships... One of the reasons I think that maritime history has really come is started to come into its own in the last 50 years or so is through is through the um, development of uh, maritime archaeology. Uh, prior to that, most maritime history was really based on existing ships and um, a sort of antiquarian interest in 
traditional sailing vessels, mostly Western, uh, and also. And it was also history about sea power, right? You had the theory. Yeah. Yeah. It was not about the, the 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 actual issues of how people sailed. Well, I mean, there there were inter that, that was that was still an interest because mm -hmm. pe there were people 50 years ago who had actually sailed in commercial sailing vessels as opposed to steam vessels, um, but and there there had been a lot of historiography around the questions of sea power um, in uh, the 19th century, late 19th century. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt, who later became uh, president in the 1880s, wrote a, a, maritime, a, a, naval, a history of the Naval War of 1812, which the Americans fought with uh, Great Britain. Uh, then towards uh, somewhat later, Alfred Thayer Mahan wrote his uh, uh, Sea Power book, the name of which I can't remember all of a sudden. <laughs> it's one of the, uh, the foundational books. It's, like it's one of the foundational books, and it's never been out of print. Um, mm -hmm. And there is there are Mahanian scholars at the Naval War College in in the United States. Uh, he is still regarded as sort of the father of of uh, naval strategic thinking. So that was one of the origins. But then all of a sudden, you had the birth of actual underwater archaeology which was made possible by the development of the Aqualong and scuba gear and Jacques Cousteau and people like that. And then in 1964 or so, there was an American named George Bass who was trained as a traditional ar land archaeologist and then transferred that, um, those uh, systems for, for doing and mapping uh, land archaeological sites to underwater sites. And all of a sudden, the, the underwater world became this um, treasure trove of historic shipwrecks, particularly in the Mediterranean, uh, where you have several thousand, about 4,000 years at this point, of underwater uh, archaeological sites. What so, so what can we learn from these ships? What can we learn from these wrecks? So the, the, the two fundamental things that you learn is uh, how the vessels were built, and then you can see uh, the evolution in size, evolution in techniques. But more important, uh, to, a great, to a large extent, is the surviving cargoes. And you can see not only what was transported, but you can also then, through the uses of paleobotany and, and things like that, uh, looking at the remains of cargoes and, and doing very close analysis, you can determine where goods came from, you can figure out where they were going, you can figure out the nationalities of the crews by the, on the basis of finds of, say, religious objects. Uh, it, there's, it, they, they can tell you an enormous amount of um, fascinating detail. And perhaps the most interesting um, shipwreck that I, well, that I can think of is um, the Belatung wreck, which is, I think, is 8th or 9th century, 8th, 9th or 10th century uh, wreck from the Java Sea, um, north of uh, Java. And this was a ship that was carrying a cargo of Chinese porcelain back from China to the Persian Gulf area. But they found three different distinct styles of uh, pottery made in China. There was green lotus leaf pattern uh, ceramics for the Indian market. There were uh, other, uh, other styles for um, the Muslim market and a, a third style for, well, sort of Persian Gulf, one side to the Arabian Peninsula, uh, the other side to Iran. Um, and what was interesting about some of the Iranian stuff was that it used, this was for, these were from inland kilns in China. And the blue that was used to make these, uh, these ceramics could only be made with cobalt that had come from Iran so the, the, the original material had been exported from Iran to China, applied in China, and shipped back to Iran. And this is 1,200 years ago. Whoa. And so you think, well, the Chinese are taking over the world market. They've been doing this for a long time. Whoa. And, and everybody's helping them. And, and uh, since so much seems to be, you know, uh, since we can get so much from, from wrecks like this, is it a problem that you know there seem to be so few wrecks in places like the the, the Arabian Sea uh, because maybe because of the tropical conditions, <laughs> though Java is tropical, yeah. or the monsoon sea? I think the monsoon sea destroys a lot. The, the monsoon, monsoon winds. Is, we, yes, I've never. Sir, one more check. Sir, one check. Do it. Is it real or not? Are there any sheets? Check. Sorry. Hello. Sorry. I didn't, I didn't, anyway, yeah. um, 
Uh, uh, just, mic, just use the mic close. Oh. Um, so yeah. my, uh, I've never been in a monsoon, but I, I've seen pictures of what happens, and it, it doesn't look like a lot of things are likely to survive over several thousand years of being battered um, in, a, in a southwest monsoon. So that is one problem. The other problem is that um, in uh, warmer waters, you have more uh, organisms that will eat wood. So the likelihood of survival is, is uh, much lower. But the other problem is that there just hasn't been the interest, um, you know, scuba diving isn't quite the thing that in India, as I understand it, that it has been in the Mediterranean and the Baltic and the American waters. So there just hasn't been the interest. But there are a lot of people doing very serious uh, maritime archaeological work in India, uh, including looking at things like the Hero Stones, um, which I, I, I didn't know about when I started writing the book, but I read several articles about them. Um, and I've corresponded with, a, with an archaeologist in Goa who, who studies them. Uh, and there have, been, there have been finds of uh, boats, not necessarily right on the coast, but in inland waters that have revealed uh, interesting details about the evolution of watercraft. And then there's also ethno-history. So you look at the forms of boats um, that were, are still being built today, or at least were being built 20, 30, 40 years ago, and you can learn a lot about that, uh, learn a lot from that uh, study as well. I mean, one thing one really gets from your book, I think particularly from the chapters about uh, the, the, the Pacific world, is that uh, maritime historians really cast their net very widely in looking for sources of information. Um, the, I mean, some of the most fascinating chapters uh, in your book are about the Pacific and how this vast, like, ocean with these tiny little islands scattered across it um, were, was, I mean, colonized, not the right word, but was settled, I guess, uh, by these incredible sailors, but who, uh, you know, because they didn't leave written records, um, the historians have had to look at various other ways to re reconstruct the histories. And can you tell us a little bit about um, these sort of, you know, alternate ways that people have had to look to reconstruct the Pacific history? Well, well, the Pacific history, I mean, all sorts of histories. One of the, the, the I think, the more obvious things about, you know, the extent of uh, ancient Indian maritime enterprise is uh, looking at the uh, religion in Bali. Right. Um, you know, Hinduism didn't just sort of grow there spontaneously. It was brought there by mariners and traders. And uh, so that's one thing. Um, but you can also look at the, um, the spread of crops. Uh, you know, the tomato is native to South America, um, and, you know, it's now a staple of Italian cuisine and lots of other cuisines, but particularly Italian cuisine. Um, there wouldn't be any Italian cuisine as we know it without um, potatoes, uh, uh, without tomatoes. Um, spices, we know from uh, Buddhist, pre uh, Buddhist monks who wrote about this, um, spices were introduced into China uh, in the first millennium, and um, he was very relieved because he said before that uh, Chinese cuisine was just boring. It was you know sort of fish and rice, and what didn't taste very good, very interesting. Uh, so that's one that's one way to do it. Um, you also look at the uh, spread of techniques. Languages is extremely important. Um, the languages spoken in Madagascar has been traced to a very particular part of Borneo. So Austronesian sailors who are the same, and descendants of the same people who sailed into the Pacific, uh, another branch of them sailed across the Indian Ocean to Madagascar. Um, then you look also at uh, navigational techniques. And as Vikram said, the, there was not a tradition of writing things down in the Pacific, uh, there was, but there was a very rich oral tradition of uh, navigation. So when, uh, when James Cook, Captain Cook in the eight, late 18th century went to uh, Tahiti, he, he writes about this in his, in his uh, accounts of the voyages, that um, there were people there who, although they didn't do it quite as much as they had at one time, could still tell people, they could tell Cook um, you know, how to get from one island to another over hundreds of miles of open ocean. Um, and then in the uh, late 20th century, there was a, uh, a, a sort of scholar of uh, Polynesian voyaging uh, in Hawaii who tracked down a guy from, I believe, Micronesia named Mao Pioleg. And uh, this was a guy who was versed in wayfinding. And he could lie in the bottom of a boat in the middle of the Pacific, and from the mo motion of the boat, he could tell 
all sorts of things about um, where waves were coming from, what, what the winds were doing, not necessarily right where he was, but also at, at a greater distance. And with his help and uh, really mining his, his uh, body of lore, um, they were able to reconstruct these voyages and reconstruct the ways in which Polynesian and Micronesian sailors had learned to navigate across the oceans. And so they, they, they could do things like they would, they would, uh, they would pay attention to the uh, migration of fish. They knew that if you saw um, an, a cloud in the distance, chances are that it was rising up over an atoll and the body of water over an atoll. So they could navigate uh, using tangible objects uh, on, on the earth and in the ocean, um, but they also had a remarkable sense of uh, astronomy and a completely different concept of how to use uh, heavenly bodies than was developed in the West. And by the West, I mean like Eurasia. Um, and uh, using these techniques, people have reconstructed these voyages, as they say, and um, retraced the same traditional routes using non, no sort of modern technology, whatever. I mean, the, the name that will come be familiar to most of us is uh, Thor Heyerdahl and the Kontiki expeditions. Now, uh, I know Heyerdahl, Heyerdahl is, a, is a controversial figure. Some, many of his claims have been debunked. Um, uh, but w w what do you make of him as a maritime historian? Did he actually do anything useful by making all his traditional boats and sailing them across the seas? Yes, uh, Heyerdahl um, did two things that were extremely important. One is he got a lot of people very interested in uh, ancient means of navigation. Um, it is true that most of his theories, or a lot of his theories, were completely wrong. He was among the first people to acknowledge that. Um, but the second thing that he did was he demonstrated that the types of vessels that people made in places like South America or the Persian Gulf or Egypt or Lake Chad were perfectly capable of doing long distance voyaging and that the, the techniques and the tools and the technologies available to ancient people uh, were more than adequate to, to do long distance voyaging. And this was extremely important. Um, the, the techniques that he, he developed have been refined considerably, uh, there, but there have been some amazing voyages of what's called experimental archaeology, uh, where people have retraced, the, the, say, the, the voyages of Vikings across the North Atlantic. Uh, Tim Severin did a Karach voyage, which is a traditional type of Irish skin boat to, to retrace the steps of St. Brendan, although St. Brendan probably didn't go to North America. Um, it, there's a, a vessel called the Magan boat, uh, which a colleague of mine named Tim Vosmer and a bunch of uh, Tom Vosmer and, and others um, designed on the basis of impressions found in uh, bitumen, uh, pieces of asphalt uh, found in Oman that are probably 4,000 years old. And looking at these, uh, they realized that the, the bitumen had been applied to the outsides of reed boats, and looking at it very carefully, they not only constructed what the reed boats, how the reed uh, bundles were constructed, but also how the knots were tied. And using this, um, these techniques, and also sampling the bitumen, uh, they figured out how to, to make bitumen of the right consistency that you could apply it to the outside of the hulls and not have it either wash out or sink the vessel. So there were, all of these things um, really have their first expression in Heyerdahl's efforts. And yes, he was a popular writer. Yes, he was wrong about certain things. But I think he, he did a, a great service in getting people interested and excited about the possibilities of uh, maritime expansion in the ancient world. OK, I'm just going to touch on two more issues before we throw it open to the audience. Um, one is uh, you know, the one way in which uh, uh, maritime issues, the sea, sort of impinge on uh, you know, uh, popular uh, on news a lot these days is in the context of climate change. I mean, uh, you know, we're talking about uh, Mumbai engaging with the sea. If some of the predictions are correct, Mumbai is going to be in the sea, I mean, in about like, you know, 50 years, uh, 50, 100 years uh, uh, from now. What does climate change, what does the study of environmental history uh, teach us about maritime issues? Well, the, um, well, it teaches us a lot of things. And as far as climate change is concerned, I don't know that um, uh, 
that's going to have a major effect in terms of um, how we how how we interpret past maritime uh, history uh, in terms of what people did on the sea. But what we have sort of begun to fathom is that uh, because the sea levels have been rising for the last several thousand years, um, not not radically at this point, well, radically now, but before it was much more violent. But say in the, uh, the settlement of North America and South America, we are now pretty sure that that was done by people hugging the coasts of what was called Beringia. Uh, back when in the light last ice age, there was no Bering Strait between Alaska and Siberia. And as a result, um, people were, are thought to have coasted along there until they got down to what's now basically the continental United States, and then from there started spreading out across the continent and continuing also down the coast towards South America. What we now realize from thinking about climate change and sea level rise is that, well, we're not going to find a lot of evidence from these people because uh, when they were, uh, when they were uh, coasting along the coasts, the coasts were much farther out and are now underwater. So that sort of stuff is not going to be um, available to us. But the environmental examination of the sea, I think, is extremely important uh, today. It's, it's really begun to arise, I think, mostly from uh, concern about the world fisheries. And as a result of that, people have been doing a lot of, uh, in the last 10 years especially, have begun looking at historical records of, of uh, major fisheries and beginning to understand exactly how, uh, how great the impact human fishing activities have been on fish stocks the world over. Uh, one of the reasons that North Amer uh, Northern Europeans got to, or were very interested in getting to North America, was because they were following the cod. And the reason they were following the cod is they had fished out all of the cod in Northern Europe. And so they went to Iceland and from the Iceland to Greenland and from Greenland to Labrador and Labrador down uh, into the Gulf of Maine. Um, now there are no more cod in uh, the Gulf of Maine. And in fact, if you want to get cod in Maine, generally it comes, uh, it's frozen and it's from Norway. So, um, but these, uh, these examinations of the fisheries are extremely important to, to tell us um, well, they can tell us one of two things. They either tell us how we can better manage our, 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 our common fish stocks, or they tell us how long we have before we run out of fish completely. That's a really important point. If anybody you know, buys fish regularly in Bombay, we can see the impact already. I mean, pomfret is a fish that is now on its way to extinction. The, you know, the size of pomfret, which is like a sort of iconic Bombay fish, uh, has become tiny because we've eaten, basically we've eaten all the big ones and we're not we're eating the juveniles now, so the, 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 the stocks are not going to recover. Bombay duck, again, the fish that's named after Bombay, the, ca the, the catch has been you know, diminishing rapidly. Um, and so, yeah, th it's very important that we deal with these sort of issues. If, um, I, could, if I could just add, yeah. I was in Lisbon last week, and to the airport in Lisbon, there is an entire store that is just cans of sardines. Just massive numbers of different types of ways of preparing sardines. There is no sardine fishery in Portugal. It's been shut down by the government. And that's what we need to do. We need to do that. I mean, we need to shut the pomfret fishery. Unfortunately, nobody wants to engage with fishery issues, so you know, it's, it's not even being talked about at the moment. I mean, I personally no longer eat pomfret, and I really recommend people don't eat pomfret because it is a completely unsustainable fish at this point. Um, okay, and the, now the, the, the last point I want to come back to is, you know, one of the things that's actually fascinating about the book is that you often, while you, you acknowledge the romanticism of the sea and, the, you know, the, all the stories about the sea, you often you keep pointing out how the actual reason people went to the sea was to fish, was to trade, and issues of trade are what has really driven uh, so much of the maritime, the maritime world. And that's why I want to bring, come back now to uh, the, something we mentioned right at the start, to the container revolution. Because uh, that is one of the things that people know that has reshaped the world in really fundamental ways, which most people don't even know about. I mean, Malcolm McLean is probably the most important person that most people don't know about. So can you tell us a little bit about Malcolm McLean and how he reshaped the world? Yes, uh, you, you're probably all familiar with the... the um, the container, the 40-foot containers, it started out as a 20-foot container, 
and that's the standard measurement of a container is the TEU, the 20-foot equivalent unit. Most containers are, are 40 feet long or two TEUs. Um, Malcolm McLean wasn't the first, but he was, he, he, he sort of, he got it in a way that nobody else had. Um, the idea of stacking boxes on ships to move cargoes. If, you, if you've been, you know, tra tra you see these big lorries with the containers with the name Sealand, that's Malcolm McLean. I mean, yeah. Sealand was the company he started, Sealand, yeah. I mean, and sold, but yeah. But now did. you see Maersk yeah. and you see China yeah. Ocean Shipping and dozens and dozens of companies. Um, there, there are a couple of interesting takeaways or, or sort of fun facts to know and tell about McLean. Um, the first time he did this in 1956, uh, he lowered the cost of, of loading a ship, uh, I think it was 96%. That was the first try. 96%? Yeah, it went from five, $5.61 a ton to 16 cents a ton. And that was just by making it more efficient, by reducing yeah. the amount of labor? That was just the first go-round. Um, then it got more complicated, ships got more complicated, Containerization couldn't have happened without computerization. Uh, there were also, uh, because you have to load ships in a very specific way, you have to, you know, it can't be too, cargo can't be too heavy below, can't be too heavy above, it has to be just right. But you can't just think about where stuff is in the ship, you have to think about what has to come out when, when it gets to the next port. So you need algorithms that are insanely complicated. Um, you know, it's like playing Tetris. Um, and there are 45,000 of these ships that you're playing Tetris with. And you're doing it at 5,000 different ports around the world. So it's, uh, and then you had to come up with things like through bills of lading. So, um, you know, if you offload a ship uh, in Mumbai and you have to actually, the cargo is going up to Nepal, you have to have bills of lading that reflect that. And so all sorts of different things about how to deal with customs barriers and all that. So that was one thing. The other thing is that um, whereas traditionally ships just would pull up to, to, to the dock in the middle of the town, um, the reason they did that was because the, the town had grown up around where the port was. Well, all of a sudden you have these vast uh, boxes um, that have to be offloaded, and you can't do that in the middle of an active city. So all of the uh, shipping activity was moved to more remote lands, farther from the centers of, of uh, town, with greater access to highways and that sort of thing. You mentioned Felix Stowe in, 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 in the UK. Yeah. What are these ports that actually really control uh, the, the, the you know, global, global trade now, which most people haven't heard of, ports like well, Felix Stowe? Uh, well, there's the Port Elizabeth in... in, in um, New York. New York used to be ringed with finger piers that came out from, you know, came out from the shore, um, and that was true up until about the 1960s. Then all of a sudden, um, all of those ships left, and they moved across the river and down a little bit uh, to uh, an area that's absolutely vast. And if you ever fly into or out of Newark Airport and you look out the window, you'll see massive numbers of cranes and huge areas of flat, flat lands just stacked with containers, either having just been taken off a ship or being ready to put onto another ship. So this was one thing, is that you removed the act of activity of shipping uh, away from where people had traditionally seen it. And you also sort of anonymized the shipping because everything looks like a, it's in a box. You have no idea what's in the box. Uh, you know, you, it used to be that, you know, you could smell the coffee and the bananas and the whatever else was coming off of ships because it was in, in sort of, you know, wooden boxes or sacks or crates um, that, you know, you could, you could feel the aroma or sense the aroma. Um, so all of that is gone. It's reduced the number of people who actually have to handle it. That's the second thing is that the efficiency means that the actual, although the volume of cargo has skyrocketed, the number of people actually employed either at sea on these hyper-efficient ships or in ports at these hyper-efficient ports has, has dropped dramatically. Um, and I think that the actual number of people empl employed in the maritime, what we consider the maritime industries, um, has actually fallen 
But we don't think of maritime industries as including truckers, but the people who drive the trucks right. are essential to the maritime industry. Right. Um, they have replaced the stevedores and the longshoremen who unloaded the ships right, before. Right, right, right. And actually, this is one that we don't have time to talk about, but you know, one of the fascinating parts about your book is that you don't just talk about the sea. For, for you, the maritime world includes rivers, it includes container trucks that take containers. I mean, it is actually you know, much more than the actual sea. Yes. It, well, it has to be because um, everything is touched by the sea and, and what happens on the sea. I mean, and, and I wanted to end with the container revolution because, you know, this is actually what touches Bombay all over again. Um, Mumbai, I mean, I th think there are a few people who are involved with the shipping world here in the audience who may disagree with me here, but Mumbai port no longer has a reason to exist. Um, it, the, Actual cynical reason why Mumbai Mumbai Port still exists in organization is because to be chair to be chairman of Mumbai Port is one of the most coveted positions in the Maharashtra state bureau state uh, bureaucracy, uh, and the bureaucrats are not going to let change that. But the fact is, economically, there's no reason for Mumbai Port to exist. All the container traffic, most of it, goes to JNPT Navasheva. If you there's this very strange sort of no man's land outside JNPT, if anybody has driven, you know, there's a side road, if you're going to Alibag, you can drive through it. You, basically, if you're, if you're, if you're uh, you know, drive, uh, if you're New Bombay, you drive, keep driving past the end of Palm Beach Drive, <laughs> suddenly you're in this strange no man's land, which is all container, container traffic, container ships, container thing, and that is the reality of most uh, shipping today. And uh, we, say we have a chance now, actually, to reclaim our port. We have a chance to open up Mumbai port we have a chance to develop it in a way that we can start engaging with the sea again in the way that Bombay always did. And that's because of the container revolution. And that's why I wanted to end with this. Um, but we have time for questions. Uh, are there anybody? Yes, the lady in the front row, and then we after that. My name is Rajiv. I'm a meteorologist. Uh, presently, we have uh, advanced technology. You're a meteorologist? That's right. OK, right. Uh, presently, we have uh, advanced techniques for uh, tracking a cyclone and storm and advanced satellite-based communication systems to communicate that information and give updates to the ships. I'm curious to know how the ancient mariners uh, would have uh, tackled uh, this uh, problem. How they communicated between ships or ship to land? No, 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 no. no how, uh, how, how they how they dealt how with they're able to uh, predict or how the they're able so that they can go and avoid the course uh, of the cyclone. Well, I, uh, for the most part, I don't think that they did. Um, they had, they had a very good handle, obviously, on the seasonal aspects of the of of the weather. I mean, monsoon comes from the word for season, um, but uh, and there and there was cert certainly a degree of weather lore that we have lost. Most of us have lost, uh, so that they would have been able to know things that we don't know uh, more intuitively. Uh, there, you know, there are still some vague um, references to things like, you know, red sky at morning, sailors take warning, uh, red sky at night, sailors delight. Um, they probably had a lot more of those kinds of things uh, that we've lost sight of. But in terms of very long distance or, or future thinking, future forward looking uh, meteorological prediction, they didn't have it. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, one second. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to keep it brief. Um, you've mentioned that we don't appreciate our archaeological sort of landmarks. Just down the road from JNPT is uh, continuing the road to Alibag is the you know abandoned ruined fort of Chol. So you've touched upon it briefly in your book, the Battle of Chol, Alfonso de Albuquerque. Yeah, Chol, but I think, Chol features a lot, uh, several times yes, in this book. Uh, but I think in the interest of like being. Uh, around Bombay, people would like to know more about it, so could you just uh, maybe elaborate on that? Chol is a fascinating settlement. I mean, I, I, I don't, has anybody apart from you uh, been to Chol? Has anyone here uh, been to Chol? Um, you know, I really recommend it. I, if Chol features a couple of times uh, in this book uh, with relation to the Portuguese. Uh, it's, it, to, to, to reach there, you can take a ship, you can take a boat to Alibag. It's about uh, two, two and a half hours drive towards uh, Janjira, Murud Janjira, and it's uh, it's amazing. It's the it's a Portuguese settlement which is pretty much well, really well preserved. I mean, uh, and it's been 
it's it's actually shocking what has happened in Chol. I mean, one of the churches, one of the old churches, has actually been grabbed by someone who's built a private house in the middle of it. It's unbelievable. But the other settlements are still there. Uh, Basin is probably a better preserved settlement because I mean there's been more interest in Basin. The church has had a bigger role to play in 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 Basin, but. Chol has similar, very similar buildings, but it's completely covered by trees. But it's it is a fascinating uh, place, and I really recommend people go to Chol. And I recommend people go to Exer. I mean, Exer, you know, Exer, you know, you can just take an auto from here and 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 go and see it. The stones are there. I mean, again, what has happened at Exer is 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 quite shocking. I mean, the archaeological survey had so little interest in it. Uh, there, there was a developer who had got the plot who was actually going to you know, uh, 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 dispose of the stones. They've only been preserved because of the local people who actually worship the stones as a deity. So they, they forced the builder to build a sort of little temple around the stone. So uh, this is good and bad because unfortunately what, what, what that temple has done is he, he's, he's done it in such a way that the concrete actually covers uh, most of the actual uh, sea battle scenes, but you can still pretty much uh, see it. But it is it, really worth seeing. Uh, we'll take one last question. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, short question. How prevalent were maritime historians and chroniclers in ancient times? Because uh, most of what we read of history is uh, like uh, Admiral Zhang He went for the emperor. It's uh, mostly a tale of kings and empires and battles. So the daily job of, uh, as in the daily life chronicle on the seas, is, was there somebody in remote antiquity uh, who did that? Um, well, for the, the two sources that I relied on the most are the um, Silipatikaram, is that, that right? And the Tilakamanjari? Yes. Silipatikaram, yeah. Yeah, and the, and the Jutakas um, also had um, you know, some wonderful descriptions of life in ports, life, uh, you know, these in beautiful scenes in the Silabatakaram. Uh, and some in incredibly harrowing and, and very realistic depictions of shipwreck in the Jatakas. So we do have a sense of, um, very vivid sense of, of maritime life in ways that we don't really have in European chronicles. Um, some, but not, not as There's much as There's probably a lot, you know. I mean, there are many temples in Tamil Nadu which have depictions of ships on it. Uh, there, there, there is probably a lot of material just along the, 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 the Coromandel coast which needs documenting, which needs analysis. Uh, yes, yeah, in the, yeah. Yeah. Uh, which one, sorry? Arakamedu, right. Actually, actually, people go to Pondicherry all the time. They don't go a little further to Arakamedu, which is, a, which is a, you know, evidence of trade with the Coromandel coast and Rome, which is amazing. Yeah. Um, so do you want to take one last question to finish the session? Uh, uh, one, one, one more time, one more question. I think somebody time is up, but okay. uh, he wants to ask the question. Okay, one last question at the back. Yes. Uh, I have an observation and a question based on that. Observation is that till as late as Second World War, uh, most of the countries which had, which became marine powers, were from islands close to a mainland. You take Norway, you take England, you take Japan, so on. But uh, after Second World War, this particular aspect has disappeared. Would you be able to explain that? Uh, so the, the, the question is, uh, uh, his contention is that uh, up to the Second World War, most uh, maritime powers were, were islands. Uh, like, I guess, uh, the, uh, uh, the United Kingdom or, uh, or, Japan. or Japan, or I guess near islands, like, like the Iberian Norway. Peninsula is like an, almost an island uh, in itself. And, uh, but after that, this has stopped. I mean, the maritime powers after that are no longer islands. I mean, well, I, I think that's a, a bit of a simplification of the problem. I mean, certainly, the United States was a maritime power for the first half of the 20th century. Um, Spain and Portugal were not islands, and they were major maritime powers. Um, there's, a, there's been a tendency historically to degrade what the Spanish accomplished. Um, they had a, a world-girdling empire for 400 years. Um, 1492, Columbus gets to a, the Americas, and uh, 1898, um, 
they surrendered the Philippines and Cuba. Uh, it's a remarkable, remarkable thing. And the reason that people don't appreciate maritime, the maritime accomplishment of the Spanish is largely to do with uh, British, British historiography, um, which the Americans then copied. Um, and it's, it's known as the black legend, and it was about how villainous and horrible and decadent that the Spanish were, when in fact, of course, they were not. Uh, they were extremely prosperous, very good at what they did. Um, and so I, I think that, yes, the, I mean, certainly the Japanese and the British were dominant uh, maritime powers, Britain for much, much longer than Japan. Um, but I, I think it's an oversimplification to see um, maritime powers being somehow peculiarly insular uh, at any point in time. And, and let's pay tribute to, since you know, you come, you've come, come to Mumbai all the way from Massachusetts. Maine. To the, for, for Maine, sorry, Maine. We, so I'm, so Maine, we, so I'm, so Maine. Maine has been independent Maine. of Massachusetts yeah. since 19, 1820. Yeah, yeah sorry, sorry. We're from Maine, where, uh, where, which is, you know, this amazing Yankee trade developed in ice to, 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 to Mumbai. And it's, it's such an unlikely uh, trade. Who would have thought that, you know, a trade that could develop in ice or, you know, all the way from, you know, from, from the American... Uh, 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 northeast, or, and yet the several trade people, but principally Frederick Tudor, developed this extraordinary trade which brought all ice all the way from ponds uh, in, in the northeast all the way to Mumbai. And you know, uh, uh, it's quite fascinating. I've done a story several years back uh, based on the T Times of India archives about the reactions in Mumbai when the first ice ships came, and people were. It was like, you know, people couldn't believe it. They was like, oh my God, there's actually ice in, in Mumbai. And, you know, uh, it's probably the first time that, uh, you know, uh, Mumbai's merchants were, uh, actually got together and raised a public subscription to build an ice house, you know, for the commercial benefit of, of, of Tudor. I mean, the ice house is demolished, but it's where the K.R. Kama Institute uh, 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 now stands. And this is an extraordinary story. And it's going to be part of your next book, I'm sure. Well, yes, and I've actually written a maritime history of Maine, and uh, the ice, ice trade features in it a lot. Um, and it is completely unlikely, but if you need ice, um, you have to buy it from somebody who has ice, and people in Maine, it gets very, very cold in Maine, and we have lots of ice. And it's one reason I'm very glad to be here now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Thank everyone, you. for being here today. Thank you, sir.